the grandeur of the theater was undeniable. Ornate chandeliers hung like luminescent tears from the ceiling, their crystalline glow casting a soft, golden light over the velvet seats and marble floors. The walls were adorned with rich tapestries depicting scenes of myth and legend, stories of gods and monsters. The air was thick with anticipation as the audience filed into the opera house, their whispered conversations and muted laughter echoing faintly through the cavernous hall. At the heart of this lavish spectacle stood Charles, accompanied by his best friend, Leonard. Leonard, a man of easy charm and infectious laughter, had convinced Charles to attend this performance. It was said to be the most exquisite, the most haunting of all operas, a composition so powerful, it could move even the most stoic to tears. The tickets had been expensive, almost prohibitively so. But Leonard had insisted it was worth every penny. Charles, ever the skeptic, had reluctantly agreed. As they took their seats in the front row, Leonard leaned in closer to Charles, his voice barely a whisper. You know the rule, right? Charles nodded, his expression serious. The one rule of this opera house was both simple and absolute. Do not speak during the performance. The consequences of breaking this rule were rumored to be severe, but no one ever seemed to know what those consequences were. They were whispered about in hushed tones, shared among those who dared to attend the opera, yet no one had ever seen what happened to those who defied the rule. The lights dimmed and the murmurs of the crowd faded into silence. A single note, impossibly pure, rang out from the stage. The performance had begun. The music was unlike anything Charles had ever heard. It was as if the notes themselves carried the weight of centuries, a melody born of ancient sorrow and unspoken fears. The singers' voices intertwined with the music, their harmonies both beautiful and tragic, evoking a sense of loss so profound that Charles felt tears welling in his eyes. He glanced at Leonard, whose face was transfixed, eyes wide with wonder. The opera progressed, each act more intense, more emotionally charged than the last. The performers moved with an otherworldly grace, their voices rising and falling in perfect synchrony with the orchestra. The story being told was one of love and betrayal, of a heart torn asunder by the cruelties of fate. It was a tale as old as time, yet it felt fresh, as if it were unfolding for the very first time before their eyes. As the final act approached, the tension in the room became palpable. The air seemed to hum with an unseen energy, a force that pressed down on the audience, urging them to remain silent. Charles felt it too, a weight on his chest, a tightening in his throat. He glanced again at Leonard, who was clutching the armrests of his seat, knuckles white. Then it happened. Leonard, overcome with emotion, let out a choked sob, a sound so quiet it was almost imperceptible. But in the silence of the theater, it echoed like a gunshot. Charles's heart stopped as he turned to his friend, eyes wide with horror. Leonard clapped a hand over his mouth, his eyes wild with fear. For a moment, nothing happened. The performance continued, the singer's voices soaring to a crescendo. Charles dared to hope that the sound had gone unnoticed, that they were safe. But then, the music stopped. Abruptly. Unnaturally. The performers froze in place, their gazes fixed on Leonard. The silence that followed was suffocating. The audience sat in stunned stillness, not daring to move, not daring to breathe. Charles could feel the sweat trickling down his back, his pulse pounding in his ears. Leonard's hand remained clamped over his mouth, his body trembling. A figure emerged from the shadows at the edge of the stage, a tall, gaunt man dressed in the black uniform of the Opera House staff. His face was obscured by a mask, his movements deliberate, methodical. He approached Leonard with an eerie calm, as if this was merely a part of the performance. Leonard tried to pull back, to flee, but the man was upon him before he could react. With a swift, fluid motion, the man placed a gloved hand on Leonard's shoulder. Charles wanted to scream, to shout, to do anything to stop what was happening, but his voice betrayed him, stuck in his throat like a stone. The man leaned in close to Leonard, whispering something in his ear, words that Charles couldn't hear but whose meaning was clear. Leonard was yanked from his seat and dragged away, disappearing into the darkness at the edge of the stage. The audience remained motionless, their eyes glued to the scene, too terrified to intervene. The performers resumed their places, the music swelled once more, and the opera continued as if nothing had happened. 
Charles sat in stunned silence, unable to comprehend what he had just witnessed. His friend, his best friend, had been taken, and he had done nothing to stop it. The opera ended with a final heart-wrenching note, the audience erupting into thunderous applause. Charles, numb and disoriented, joined in the clapping, though the sound felt hollow, distant. The lights came up, and the crowd began to file out of the theater, their faces alight with the thrill of the performance. Charles remained seated, staring at the empty spot where Leonard had been just moments before. It wasn't until much later, when the theater was nearly empty, that Charles found the strength to stand. He made his way to the exit, his mind racing, replaying the events of the night over and over again. He had to find Leonard. He had to know what had happened to him. Outside, the cool night air did little to clear his head. The streets were quiet, the only sounds the distant hum of traffic and the rustling of leaves in the breeze. Charles began to walk, unsure of where he was going, driven only by the need to understand, to make sense of the nightmare that had unfolded before his eyes. The next morning, the headlines screamed the news that Charles had been dreading. Opera house horror. Man found dead in grisly scene. The article detailed how police had discovered a room in the opera house drenched in blood. The walls and floor slick with gore. Body parts, unidentifiable in their mutilation, were strewn across the room, the remnants of what could only be described as a massacre. The victim had been identified as Leonard Mason, a local man who had been attending the opera with a friend. The authorities were baffled, the cause of death a mystery, the scene so brutal that even the most seasoned detectives were left shaken. Charles read the article in a daze, the words blurring together as his mind struggled to process the horror. Leonard was gone, torn apart in some unimaginable way, and it was all because of that one tiny sound, a sound that should have been nothing, but it cost Leonard his life. The final lines of the article burned into Charles's mind. The Opera House has refused to comment on the incident, but it is believed that the performance will continue as scheduled. The one rule remains. Do not speak during the performance. Charles closed the newspaper, his hands trembling. The image of Leonard being dragged away replayed in his mind, over and over, until it was all he could see. The opera's melody still echoed in his ears a haunting reminder of the night he would never forget.